Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us back here at the No Sound Bites Allowed podcast on the Exceptional Conservative Network. We thank you for joining us here, and we do hope that you check out some of the other shows on the channel with Ken McClinton and Dr. Jane Ruby and so many others. Uh, we all try our very best to bring you the most interesting and unique perspectives, especially from a Republican conservative viewpoint. But we do invite libertarians and progressives and Democrats to be involved. I always look for all of your comments. I want to hear what everyone has to say. Tell me when you think I'm wrong. I want to hear that. Let's have that discussion because we can't get to the right answers if we can't have the conversation. And that's what this is all about. Uh, getting into more details to get the answers that we all need to be able to move forward, to get a better country. Because we can't just go by emotions and how some people feel. We need to go with the facts and we need to have a conversation. Now, I do also want to mention that if you are in the Binghamton region in the southern tier, please drop by the Belmar Pub and the Park Diner. These are friends of mine. Uh, this is not a paid advertisement. I do go to these establishments. I enjoy them a great deal. Good prices, good food, great service, and a great uh, atmosphere. I advise you, if you can, drop by both and do say that Mike Voss dropped, uh, you know, said hello. So I wanted to mention that, and I didn't mention them before, and I apologize, but I do like to mention my friends and help them out when I can. So we were talking about, in the first half, in the first hour of the show, we had been talking about what happened in Virginia Beach. We were talking about what was happening in Deerfield, New York, in reference to the Second Amendment. We were talking, uh, at the very end of the show here, we, we were ending the hour talking a bit about what's going on with the undocumented immigration, that the Business Council of New York State, under the direction of Heather Brissetti, has decided that it is in the best interest of New York, and in particular their organization, to be able to give illegal aliens, what they call undocumented immigrants, um, the ability to have a driver's license. Because it is the right and decent thing to do. A very emotional statement that's not backed up by actual fact. And so, again, when I left, I, I was saying, well, this is a problem for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is it violates law. It violates a lot of law. Now, there was a wonderful thing I saw about this, and I want to bring it up. A gentleman making a comment in the Buffalo News, a Mr. Michael Kearns, had a great article about this, and, and it's by Another Voice. It was published on May 13th, ahead of this news from the Business Council of New York, and he mentions that the green light bill raises legal and security problems. And this is in the Buffalo News, again on May 13th, by Michael Kearns. And one of the things that he mentions here about this is that, uh, and I'm quoting, legislators supporting the bill primarily argue that it will enable undocumented workers to travel to their places of employment. The Immigration Reform and Control Act, IRCA, made it a federal crime to employ undocumented workers. The Supreme Court has ruled a state cannot adopt laws regarding immigration unless when unless the state action, quote, mirrors federal uh, objectives and for furthers a legitimate state goal, end quote. This bill encourages undocumented or otherwise illegal employment, which is in the violation of federal law. And you can check out his entire article and we'll have a link to that uh, in the description. So there's the problem. There's the problem. As he very eloquently puts it, uh, in fewer words than I've already put to it, that this is just, we're breaking the law. We're picking and choosing laws. And this is for the benefit of an individual. And I find it interesting that the very same progressive movement that hates business, that wants to take away profit, I mean, that's what socialism is. Democratic socialism removes profit. You don't get to have a profit. You only get to have enough for you. That is the basis of socialism itself. And they're breaking the law. The same people who say that businesses should not have profit are the very same people who are saying 
that we should break the law and allow illegal aliens to be able to have driver's licenses. And we know that when illegal aliens have driver's licenses, they vote, especially in New York, where we're looking to have the uh, we're looking to have automatic registration. And that's something that's new in New York State, and it's being pushed by the single party Democratic leadership. But they're trying to have it so that everybody, everybody gets to be, uh, you automatically are registered. As soon as you get a driver's license, you get the registration to be able to vote. So illegal aliens will inevitably, if they get a driver's license, will be able to vote in elections, which is a violation of law, by the way. In case you didn't know, uh, there's actually a law about that. And that is 18 USC Code 611 Voting by Aliens, which prohibits the ability of illegal aliens to vote in federal elections. And you can look that up. And again, that'll be in the description. So there's the problem. And that's what I think they want. Because if you have, and this is primarily Democrats, are out there pushing for rewards for illegal aliens and getting them jobs and not reporting them to ICE and not allowing them to be deported and opening up the border, if that's what Democrats are doing and Democrats are saying, oh, and by the way, you have the ability to vote in an election even though that is illegal too. And again, they're picking and choosing laws to enforce and to live by. So they have their sanctuary cities, they have their sanctuary states like New York State and California, and they're giving illegal aliens driver's licenses which they are then automatically registering them to vote, and that allows them to get into the election process. And then by that, they then turn around and say, hey, illegal aliens that we have now rewarded for breaking the law, who do you want to support? People who actually follow the law, or do you want to follow, uh, or do you want to support us because we're benefiting you? We're giving you rewards for breaking national law. And gee, I wonder what's going to happen there. And in New York State, where we are losing population rapidly, where we are rapidly losing population because we're of the horrible, horrendous political, uh, uh, economic choices made by Governor Cuomo, where we've lost 1.5 million people, possibly 1.8 million people, if you don't count the surge of immigrants, in particular illegal aliens, into the state, then, yeah, they want those illegal aliens to vote. They need to make up the difference. So this is all kind of connected. So immigration is directly connected, especially when we're talking about illegal immigration, is very much directly connected to, at the end, the result of voting. Because by giving the illegal aliens a driver's license and changing the law to automatically register everyone who has a driver's license, you then enable those illegal aliens to vote into elections to promote a specific political party. It's not a conspiracy theory. This is the, these are the consequences of the laws that are being put out there that you're not being told any of the consequences. Oh, it's, it's just a good and decent thing to give illegal aliens the right to drive except they're not supposed to be driving. They're not supposed to be in the nation. And they're not allowed to work. And it's illegal for them to be working. And if we're giving them the right to vote, if we're giving everyone the right to vote because they have a driver's license, then we're going to inevitably have them voting in our national elections. And when we're hearing about how much Democrats hate collusion and are so worried about Russians interfering with our elections, then why are we fighting to give illegal aliens the right to vote? If we're really worried, if Democrats and progressives are really worried about foreign influence on our elections, then why give foreigners who have violated our laws to start with the ability to vote in our elections? No, they're not worried about it. That's the honest answer. They're worried about getting what they want. They want power. And that is just another means to be able to do so. And that is the honest answer. We need to be more honest in our politics. I'm not so much upset that, well, I am upset about illegal aliens being in our country, about businesses looking at their profit motive and being willing to break the law and actually advise people to 
consent and to help them break the law for their profit motive. I, I disagree with that entirely. I disagree with illegal aliens being able to vote in any manner, especially when it's sanctioned by the state, when government itself is saying, no, no, break our laws just as long as we get the reward, the benefit of being in power. I'm sorry, that is not beneficial to anyone in the nation. I don't think so. Maybe you think I'm wrong. Please tell me if you think I'm wrong. I want to hear the argument that says, no, it's really good if we have illegal aliens voting in our elections. And yet it's bad for foreign countries or foreigners to be influencing our elections. That's bad. They can't influence our elections, but they can vote in them. Really? Where is the logic in that? Please explain that to me. And I know that's not the popular view. That's not the view that's being put out on CNN and MSNBC, but it should be because this is the honest consequence of what is being done. This is the honest reality. And if we can't be honest with our voters and with ourselves as citizens, then we're never going to get an honest and real and effective answer. And that is important. That is critical. But maybe you disagree. And if you do, that's fine. Tell me you disagree. I, I want to hear that argument. But we've been talking about a lot of controversial issues so far today. And I'm going to go into another very controversial issue in just a second here. Uh, what we're going to talk about is the incident that's been happening. We've seen it several times now across the nation. And that is, is it all right when we're talking about history? When we're talking about the history of the nation, uh, we're talking about things like slavery, which is a hot button issue. No one wants to really discuss that. And part of that is how do you discuss slavery? How do you let younger students understand what was slavery? How did it have an impact? How did it exist? How did it function? And we can't show roots on TV anymore. Sadly, for some reason. I don't know why. But it's bad for TV. It's bad TV. It's too violent. It's too... All kinds of emotions. And it probably breaks a bunch of PC regulations. It's not politically correct. Although it's accurate. And it's important. And we should talk about it. And we should have that on TV. And why it was so groundbreaking in the 70s when it was on national TV and actually moved forward the discussion about race and racism and, and slavery and the past of the nation and where it is today and Jim Crow, all very important issues that we should talk about and we should have some viewpoint on as a nation. But instead, we don't. And so there are teachers throughout the nation, and this has been happening for a while now, and I'm just pulling out a couple of issues. Uh, back in 2017, there was a teacher in New Jersey, in Maplewood, New Jersey. Uh, and this is an article from the CBS Channel 2, WLNY, in uh, CBS New York, talking about a Maplewood Elementary School. The article is actually from March 20th of 2017, where a mock slave auction stokes tempers at Maplewood Elementary School. And very simply, in this article, uh, we see that there was a teacher, a substitute teacher, who was going in and they wanted to teach about slavery. And their choice and their decision was to have a mock uh, slavery auction where white students were beating on uh, and mock buying black students. And everyone was outraged. It was horrendous. The teacher got fired um, and, and, and then they had a bunch of uh, uh, conversations with the kids because they were somehow emotionally destroyed for the rest of their lives because of this, or at least that's what was alleged. And here we are. Let's go into 2019. And in 2019, we again see, this time in Watertown, New York, and according to Spectrum News, and they're reporting on this as of May 31st, yesterday, Friday, um, that a Watertown teacher was placed on leave 
after an alleged mock slave auction, where once again, a teacher went out and said, hey, we're going to have these black students and they are going to be bought by slaves, by, by the white students. And those, and those slave children would have to refer to the white children as Master XYZ, whatever the last name was. And this is what slavery encompassed. This is what it really was like. This is a, a minuscule impact of what slavery was. And people are losing their minds. They are they're losing their minds about this. And I have to say, why? Why is it such a big deal? Why is it so horrible? Why is it so horrendous to teach children about what happened? Because the question is, isn't, did slavery exist? It did. We know that. And it's not that it was a bad thing. We know that too. We agree on that. Okay. Why is it bad to give these kids the touch, just a, 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 a taste, the smallest, most innocuous taste of this is how horrible this was. This is how demeaning it was. This is how, uh, how it devalued people and how it took away from people's lives. It's a lesson. Why is it wrong? Because I'm hearing a lot of people and they're saying it boggles their mind, that they feel like it was horrible, that this was a terrible thing to do to kids in fourth and fifth grade. Why? What is wrong? I understand it's a difficult subject and, and difficult subjects need to be addressed. And maybe they should be addressed with seventh and eighth graders or kids in high school. Okay, but again, it comes down to this is real. It happened. In fact, slavery happens right now. It's happening in Africa as we speak. There are several nations in Africa where we have uh, those of a Muslim faith do sell and buy others. I believe it was Boko Haram, one of the fanatical Islamist groups, does buy and sell slaves. So we have slavery real in the world at this moment. And we're talking about a real and historical fact in the United States. And why is this bad? Because we're telling kids that at one point in history, this is how one group treated another group and it was wrong. And it felt wrong. And doesn't this feel bad? Because that kid's going to be damaged for life? Really? Why? You gave him a lesson. It's a lesson they may not like. But then again, there are a lot of lessons in life that we don't like. Is it bad? And, and I'm, when I look at this, um, and here's one of the art, and I'm going back to the Spectrum News article about this over in Watertown, and we see that the Onondaga County NAACP, that they made a comment on this, okay? And their statement is, there, there shouldn't be a soul in the universe that should be saying, well, maybe it's okay. It wasn't okay. It wasn't okay during slavery times. It's, it isn't okay now. There shouldn't be anyone on the fence. Make no mistake about it. Well, I, I'm sorry. Why? Again, I come back to the question, why? Yes, yes, in America, because it's not universal, because it's existing today, it's happening right now in the world. Slavery does still exist, but in the United States it does not. And that's a good thing, because we remember what slavery was. We remember why we fought against it. We remember these things, and in, in, in discussing it, we prevent it from happening again. But why should no one be having a conversation? Why is it not okay to go through with that? Was it because, it, would it have been better? Would it be okay if black students were buying white students and doing everything exactly the same except it was a black student buying a white student? Would that make it okay? Does that change anything? No, I, I don't believe it does. I don't think there's a difference here. The question is, it doesn't make 
those black students or those white students inferior or superior to anyone. There is no difference here. It doesn't change anything. If we are saying, here is an example of why this is so bad. And if this feels bad to you just a little bit right now, imagine if that was a lifetime and everyone was doing that. This is why it's bad. That's a, le that's a teaching moment. That's a learning moment. That's a lesson that we all can grow from. But instead, we're told, and again, we're being told it's bad, it's wrong, it shouldn't be happening. But we're not being told, why is it bad? Why shouldn't it be happening? Why can you not do that? Why can we not reenact this to make the point? And here's the key question, to make the point that this was wrong. And every indication, in whether it was in Maplewood, New Jersey, or if it's in uh, Watertown, New York, or anywhere, I would think, if it's, if it's being presented as in this is wrong and this is why this is wrong, this is what happened and this is why it's wrong, then what's the problem? I don't understand. And people say, well, Mike, you just don't get it because you're not black. Um, if you're looking at me, if you're not hearing this on the audio, if you're, uh, if you're actually seeing the video, I think that answers itself right there. But for those who are listening to just the audio, yeah, I'm a black Hispanic. I am very much a black Hispanic. It's very obvious. Yeah, I'm black. And I'm asking the question, why is this wrong? If it's being presented, and it appears that it is, as a lesson in history and with an example of why this is wrong. Why is it wrong? Oh, you can't do that. You should never do that. Why? Why shouldn't we do that? All we're being told is you can't do it. Why? What's so wrong? Why have we made our kids so delicate that even giving them this example somehow destroys their lives? Nothing. There should be no way that we could destroy their lives. Can we not talk about the Holocaust? Now, what, and I, I suppose the argument could be made, well, you could do the same thing with the Holocaust and make one group of kids Germans and the other group of kids Jews. And you could, but it doesn't transfer exactly the same way. Although, I would say, if you could make it reasonably the same in the same kind of enactment that, you know, this group of students are being subjugated and these group of students are the ones doing it and this is wrong, then, yeah, I'd be for that too. I don't have a problem with that. I don't see the problem with having a discussion where we're saying this is something that has happened in history and it is wrong and it has hurt people. And here is an example of that hurt. And this is, some, this is the reason why we don't do that, why we don't condone that, why it's wrong to do that, and why we fight against it. But just to tell me no, just to tell someone, no, you can't do that. You can't do that because we say so. Now, there is no difference in just mandating an answer. I have no, you don't grow from that. You don't learn from that. Oh, we just can't talk about that. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It means that it's forbidden. That just means that you don't get to learn, you don't get to expand, you don't get to grow. And that's a problem. When people don't get to have to ask that question, why is that wrong? And get an answer, a real, honest, non-manipulative answer of why is that wrong. If you don't do that, then they will repeat. That is, you're not telling history. You're not explaining history. And I don't mean rewriting history, which we hear a lot of. But if we're not being accurate and saying this is what happened, and this is why it happened, and this is why it is wrong, then you will inevitably repeat that process. And we've already gone into, we've started that already. I mean, when you're talking about safe spaces and, and isolating people because, well, you know, black students can go over here, but whites aren't allowed. Or that's, that's even though it's voluntary segregation, it is still segregation. It is a step backwards in time. It is a step back towards this Jim Crow era mentality. When we start categorizing people with the micro categories that we see that's very predominant 
in democrat socialist ideology that we hear from people who have gender identity politics where they categorize people well you're a straight male or you're a straight woman you're black male or gay or you're transgender and you're this race and you're that when you start micro categorizing people like that there is no difference between that and segregation, there is no difference, in my mind at least, between that and what that slippery slope that starts going back towards Jim Crow laws that goes back towards slavery. And maybe it's not a physical slavery, but it's still an emotional slavery. It's still, it can be an economic slavery. It is definitely devaluing certain human beings and elevating other human beings on arbitrary basis because of someone's political preference, because they're in power and they want it to be that way. And if you don't discuss it, then that's just the way it is. And that has always historically led to violence and upheaval and, and people being downtrodden and, and losing their rights. Do I think that it, it was it the most tasteful way of discussing slavery? Probably not. Probably not. You probably could have done it a lot more tastefully and or, or more imaginatively. But is it a horror? Should we fire everyone involved? Do we need to have sensitivity training for the students because of this? No. No, you really don't. You're, you're, you're making something out of nothing. This is very simple. This is a very simple thing that can be resolved and explained to the students. And if we don't try and over sensationalize this, if we're not treating the kids like they're morons, and if we actually give them an answer besides "you can't do that," or that you 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 must be damaged for life. Well, again, this is about victimhood. These kids are damaged for life. We have destroyed them for life because we have given them an example of history. We have given them a factual, real experience of history. And hopefully, and as from every indication, they were given at the same time an answer of why this is wrong. Because it, from what I can understand in the lesson plan, and this is the important thing, which isn't absolutely clear, but if at the same time they were being given the answer that this is wrong, here is why, then what is the problem? What, these kids are going to be damaged for life? Are you kidding me? If this is going to damage them for lives, if they are victims now, then they are done. They will never succeed. They're going to have problems throughout life. If that is all it takes to destroy their lives, then they were never going to make it in the first place. Life is difficult. There are problems. People don't agree. It's not nice. If this is all it takes, if, if just this one moment is destroying your life, then you have a problem, Snowflake. You, you are far too fragile. And something is inherently wrong with what's going on with you. That's my opinion. Now again, people may disagree. And I really would love to hear what others think about this. And I would like to hear why is it wrong. Not it's wrong so don't speak about it. I want to hear why is it wrong. What specifically about this is wrong? Because we're not hearing that in the news. What specifically makes it wrong if the intent is to teach why this incident that happened in fact and is wrong. I mean, we, we really need to address that. I don't know. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just not sensitive enough or that other people are way too sensitive. I don't understand. But I think we need to have that discussion because without it, we're, we're going into a dangerous place of censoring what can and cannot be said about fact, about history. And it's like someone denying the Holocaust existed. And given enough time, if we can't talk about slavery, people will deny that slavery existed. And the easiest way for a Holocaust or for slavery to come back is to not talk about it existing in the first place. And that will allow people to do it again. That's just a reality, I believe. But that's my point of view. All right, so we're going to take another quick break, and then we'll be right back in just a moment. <laughs> Yeah. 
for joining us back here at No Sound Bites Allowed. And this is being presented on the Exceptional Conservative Network. That's right, the TECN TV. And I hope that everyone is enjoying this. Uh, we're coming up on, we have a little bit less than a half hour left on our show today. Uh, we started at noon, as always on Saturdays. We start at noon and we go until 2 o'clock. Uh, on the weekdays, we normally have our show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m., Thursdays at 1 p.m. and we always invite you no matter what day it is to come and join us we will be having very soon on our program um, and it's happening right now there is the launch the official launch of the campaign for Shannon Wright in Baltimore right now uh, she's looking to be the mayor of Baltimore and uh, she's having her official campaign launch as we speak today uh, going on right now. We hope to have Shannon Wright back on. She's been on with us before and, and she announced her intent to run and now she's doing it officially. And so uh, we look to have her back on the program very soon to talk more about what's going on in Baltimore, the need of a, a very different point of view, a very different change than what we've seen because Baltimore suffers from the same thing that we see in Chicago, the same thing we see in New York State, uh, what we see in California, where we have single-party rule that has gone on for decades, and the result of that has been everything opposite of what has been promised. People have been promised that they would be safer, and they are not. They have been promised that they would have more work, and they don't. That they would have lower taxes, and they're not. Um, we very often, and this is kind of funny to me because we keep seeing this, where, oh, you're getting this promise. It's going to be great. We're going to put in more gun control so you will be safer. And people aren't safer. Dramatically and demonstrably not safer. That, well, you're going to be able to get free stuff except your taxes are going up and you're going to pay for more. And you don't get to have that free stuff. But you do get to be dependent on the government. And we see those communities and their neighborhoods fall apart, not bit by bit, year by year, and they just become worse and worse. And we're seeing that in Baltimore, just like we've seen it in Chicago, we've seen it in Detroit, we've seen it in New York, we've seen it in California, and it needs to change. And so that's one of the things we were talking with Shannon Wright about uh, in the past, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to be talking about it again when we have her back on the program, uh, possibly Tuesday or Thursday. But we do invite you to come into the program and check it out at 1 p.m. and have these conversations with us. So that's one of the things that we wanted to talk about, and we know we're going to have her on. I also want to mention that we spoke with Steve Sup Suppersend, who recently was in the Binghamton region. He joined the Binghamton School Board, and we want to congratulate him on his election win. Steve Suppersend, uh, is a, he's also a former member of the Bronx, like myself. Uh, he lives up here in upstate New York now with his family and his kids, and he's very much involved, and uh, we think he's going to be a great addition to the school board in helping to direct kids to be able to better understand the opportunities for their future. And that's, that's a big thing. That's important. So we do want to congratulate him on that, and I was speaking with him yesterday. We hope to have Steve Supperson on the show very soon to be able to speak with you as well about what his experience is to take on that first elected role. Um, he had a breakout election. He had the most votes of any candidate in that race for the school, uh, school board, uh, far and away beating everyone in most of the average uh, returns for a school board election. And so we want to talk to him about what it is to now be a politician, what he hopes to do in the school board, and how it will help kids in the future to be able to be successful, both in the community and in their own lives. 
So we'll talk about that soon. But I want to talk about something. Uh, we've talked about a lot of subjects here today. We have gone through a lot of controversy, uh, whether it's down at Virginia Beach or it's in Deerfield, New York, Maplewood, New Jersey, uh, in Watertown, New York, uh, issues that are affecting tens of thousands, millions of people in their expansions. We're talking about immigration and illegal immigration and how that will affect votes, that will affect people's lives, that will affect businesses, and what are some of the consequences. And that's one of the big things we want to do here. And it is very important to us to always hear your point of view, to hear what you think about this, because it's not just us. It's not just us here at No Sound Bites Loud or on the Exceptional Conservative Network. We're part of a community. We're part of a nation, just like you are. And I know a lot of people get worried sometimes, that they get afraid. And I've had these conversations with people where they've said to me privately, individually, you know, I'd love to talk about that, except I'm afraid. I'm afraid because uh, my job, retribution at my job, my peers are going to pick on me because it's not a popular subject. That if I say something on Facebook or Twitter or social media, that they're going to attack me for this. And I get it. I do. I, I really get that. I understand that a lot of people get attacked for it. But that's not a reason to be silent. That's not a reason why we can't have these conversations. And in fact, it is all the more of a reason why I believe we must. And that's why the Exceptional Conservative Network, that's why No Sound Bites Allowed exists. Because we have to talk about these things. And you don't have to agree. You can say that and you think I'm wrong. You can tell me why I miss something or something that I don't understand. And explain that. Because we need these conversations. Because we keep forgetting. Our politicians are just human beings. And human beings are never 100% correct. We often, all of us, we get it wrong sometimes. We don't understand something. We're emotionally motivated by something. And we don't see the big picture. We don't look for the big picture sometimes. And we need to remember our politicians, the elected officials, are exactly the same. They didn't get smarter because they got elected. They didn't get wiser because they got elected. They don't have some greater insight than you and I do because they got elected. They are exactly the same. They are no different. I've talked to dozens and dozens of politicians over the years and candidates for political offices. And I can tell you directly in all my interviews, in my conversations, my research, my work as a political commentator and writing articles, they are no different than anyone else. They make as many mistakes as anyone else. They're as smart and as bad and as good as everyone else. There is nothing special about an elected official. And when they come out and say they plan to do X, Y, Z, it makes them no better. It makes them no worse, but it makes them no better. They have no greater insight. They do know the issue maybe a little bit better because they have more details, but that's something that anyone can gain. It is just a matter of doing the homework, going out there and actually checking out what is going on. But it does not make them smarter or better or anything different. And I don't care if they're running for, whether they're going for the school board or they're going for the presidency, there is no difference in these people. None whatsoever. I did want to take a moment though, uh, and I understand that. So please, and I say that because don't be afraid to make a comment. I know I put out a poll and I asked people um, earlier this week the question about abortion and eugenics from the Supreme Court uh, especially Justice Clarence Thomas. He, he put out a, a comment, uh, his, his remarks about a decision in reference to abortion. We covered that a lot. And no one wants to talk about it. I've seen hundreds of people respond who have looked into what we've said on social media, who have looked at videos and articles that we have written and they while they've been actively looking at it, not one person wants to say a word because everyone's afraid of what someone else will say. And that is the problem. We should never be afraid of saying, this is what I think, period. 
because none of these other people speaking about it are any smarter or any better than anyone else. And we need to remind them of that because they think they are. And that's the real problem. So uh, with that said, let me also go on. I want to uh, also address something else because we always like to keep an eye on what's going on with our presidential race. And we see that the 2020 Democratic candidates, they're getting ready for their upcoming uh, debate. And I've talked about that earlier this week as well. And I just wanted to check out where are some of the big favorites. And if you notice, um, on the big list now, we have Bill de Blasio, who recently just came out and made his announcement. He's at 0.3%, along with Kirsten Gillibrand at 0.3%. She's doing worse and worse by the day. They're both non-relevant individuals. Uh, we see that Cory Booker is back at 2.3%. Again, he's been not really moving anywhere. He's pretty static, uh, but he's holding steady. So is Beto O'Rourke, or otherwise known as Robert O'Rourke, the fake Hispanic. We see that Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren, very solid and very much in the same position they have been in third and fourth place with no real change whatsoever. Um, again, Biden still dominates all of the candidates with, with uh, Bernie Sanders being the second place. And we see no change. We really and honestly see no change. Essentially, other than Cory Booker, everyone after Cory Booker, every other candidate after Cory Booker, so Klobuchar, Castro, Yang, Gabbard, Williams, uh, Ryan, Bennett, Bullock, you can just forget about them. They are not factors. They may get on a stage of 20 uh, candidates, and they may go out there to try and get their name out, but quite honestly, they're meaningless. They're not going anywhere. They, they are done. Uh, that is my opinion. Now, you may disagree with that, and that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. You may think that I've, I missed something here, that I misunderstood something here, and it's quite possible. But I have to believe that when you see candidates at 0.3%, uh, and they're trying to be president at this point, and they've been out there for months talking about this, they're done. Their campaigns aren't moving forward. If you're, un if you're at 1% or less, your campaign is done. Uh, the miracle it would take to gain any foothold is extraordinary. You would have to do something that we've never seen in politics. I mean, it, that wouldn't just be a comeback. That would be, you know, <laughs> the resurrection. It, it, it just is beyond words. So I find it interesting because we still hear Kirsten Gillibrand. She's still out there trying to push, and she's my New York State senator. And I think that... Uh, it would be best for New York State, both her and de Blasio, to just get out the race. Just and focus on their jobs. Bill de Blasio to focus on New York, uh, New York City, where he's not he's not liked, and he is seen as not doing a good job. And he should stop worrying about his political ambition and worry about actually doing the right job for New York City, which most people seventy six percent, based on recent polling from Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac, excuse me, uh, don't believe he's doing. Well, he needs to get to his job and actually work on it. And as for Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, you know, you've already lied to your constituents. Stop trying to get new people. Stop trying to worry about what's going on in New Hampshire and Iowa and North Carolina and focus on the people that you are elected to take care of that you lied to. Make up, that, make up for that lie. <coughs> excuse me. Make up for that lie that you told, that the fact that you said that you would serve your entire term and had no interest in running for president. Live up to your word, get back to work, and make something happen that's worthwhile in the state senate, which, uh, excuse me, in the national senate, in the senate of Congress. Get to work, because quite honestly, looking at her history, Warren, uh, Cory Booker, Klobuchar. Biden and uh, Bernie Sanders, they have nothing to offer. There is nothing that they have done of any substance or 
or worth. Get in there and do your job. Then maybe you'll be considered for president. But at this moment, I just don't see any of them doing better. And, and I find it quite funny that consistently the rank and file of the Democratic Party are telling the elites, the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortezes of the world, the Tom Perez's of the, of the DNC, that they reject the Democratic Socialist movement, the far left fringe ideology, and that they want something that is more centrist, which is why Joe Biden is hands and shoulders, excuse me, head and shoulders and just demonstrably more popular and far ahead of everyone else. Do I think that Joe Biden's a great choice? Absolutely not. I, and his history proves that. I don't think he's a good candidate. And saying that leaders from outside of the United States are interested in him as being leader of the United States, that goes right back to the collusion question. And if you didn't want the influence of other nations, why are you going to take the advice of other nations in leading our nation? Isn't that a problem? If you're saying that they shouldn't be involved in our elections, why are you letting them lead whether or not you're going to be a candidate in our elections? He's got a lot of problems. Do any of them beat Gov uh, President Trump? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I don't think any of them have the capabilities to do so, and, I don't, and that's demonstrated in what they're doing now. They are so busy fighting amongst each other over the same gender identity politics that they are not leading the race. And the person who has the least to do with the gender identity politics, not that he doesn't have any, but the one who has the least is Joe Biden, and he is leading the race because he stands out the most. And the funny thing is he's trying to give that up and get more into the gender and identity politics, which I don't understand. You would think that the rest of the candidates would be trying to become more centrist like Joe Biden and, and, and therefore be more of competition. But instead, we see Joe Biden trying to be more like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and more like Cory Booker and Kamala Harris. Uh, and he's trying to be more gender and identity politics focused which is exactly opposite of why he's in the lead. I don't know what's going on with the Democratic Party. It doesn't make any sense. But I cannot see that anything they're doing is going to help them move themselves forward. I can't wait until we get into the debate. And you know for a fact that the debate, when they talk about immigration, will not say, gee, illegal immigrants, they won't even mention the word illegal immigrant. They will say undocumented immigrants. I guarantee you that. And they are not going to take the point of view and mention that the undocumented, quote, illegal immigrants are, are in the nation breaking the law. They're not going to mention that it's a reward to be able to give them a path to citizenship or to give them driver's licenses or to allow them to vote in elections. They're not going to say that. That is what they're doing. And they're going to word it kind of like we saw with uh, the... Uh, the board for New York State, the Business Coalition of New York, where they're going to say it's the right thing to do, but they're not going to mention that it's also the illegal thing to do. They're going to talk about gun control, but they're going to leave out the fact that every single gun control bill fails and has failed. Look at Chicago. Look at Virginia Beach. And that they're punishing law-abiding citizens who are defending themselves, like in Watertown. I don't know. I'm looking forward to seeing this debate on June 26th and June 27th, and I don't see that there's going to be a big difference other than we're going to see a lot of people, probably like de Blasio, probably like Kirsten Gillibrand, they're going to be out the race. And whether or not they leave it right after that debate doesn't really matter. But with six minutes to try and pick between each of the candidates the big thing is going to be, what do they dress like and do they stumble? Do they stutter? Do they answer quickly? And that's going to be the whole race to start with. And it's just sad. I don't know, but that's my opinion. And again, much of this has been what I think about what we're seeing out there. I will include the links and the sources. Hopefully you'll give me your comments and tell us what you think about it. We are looking forward to hearing from you, whether you agree with us or disagree, because your voice matters and it should be heard. 
and no one on social media or anywhere else should take away from your ability to speak because it's your right. It's the First Amendment. You have a right to speak and our nation needs you to speak. So I hope you join me on Tuesday uh, at 1 p.m. as we continue with no sound bites allowed and here on the Exceptional Conservative Network as we're going to continue to try and do our very best for you. Also, please take a look at some of our other videos that we've done that you may enjoy and please subscribe, like, share, and comment. It's always important. And if you can, please donate, whether it's a dollar, five, fifty. It all makes a difference to us. It helps keep the lights on and keep the show going. And I hope that you've enjoyed it. And if you think of ways that we can do better, let us know. And we will try and do that too. So until Tuesday, I wish everyone a great weekend. We look forward to seeing you soon. And uh, be well.